Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Glittering Bell Jar. We are in season two, covering the Half Blood Prince doing things a little differently as we do. We're already reading the series backwards and this season we are just giving you one chapter at a time, a short 15 to 20 minutes. That way you can pop in, enjoy your day with us and then pop on out. I am of course here with Valerie, my amazing co-host. How are you, Valerie? I'm good. I'm good. It's a very nice day here, as you can see if you're watching us on YouTube, which, by the way, I don't think we ever mentioned, we are available on YouTube if you're a YouTube listener or watcher or whatever. You're on, we're on your podcast players. We're on your YouTube. We're everywhere. You know, most people don't realize that. Anyway, I'm good. Uh, but yeah, it's very, it's very sunny and very warm here today, which is really nice. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I had a pretty nice day today. It's a little muggy out, but I do live in North Carolina, so that does happen. I'm it excited to happen. be here, though. Yeah. So I noticed you're wearing blue. So you're channeling Ravenclaw today. And I have yellow nails, which is me having my inner Hufflepuff come through, I think. Uh, we're just not quite in our normal houses, but that's okay because everyone is a little bit of all four houses, I like to think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I was going to be another house, it would definitely be Ravenclaw all day. Just let me sit in there and talk about stuff. Obviously, it's what we do here. So <laughs> I would never get in because the quiz questions to get through the door are just too hard. <laughs> As we discussed last season. Yeah. And That's I okay. like I'd to think Ravenclaw. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just be hanging out outside the door. I'd be like Neville. I'd be the Neville equivalent. <laughs> or I'd know, I'm just going to get let in because I don't know the password. Uh, I just don't believe that, but it's <laughs> a nice, it's, it's a funny it's thought. An easy one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as a reminder, if you are listening for the very first time, please go back and start at episode one. It's not going to make sense if you jump in partway through, and you're just going to have a better time. And we're on episode six, so you got a really good little binge session going if you just jump jump back a few and start over. This week we are covering chapter 25, which is The Seer Overheard, one of my favorite chapters in this book. Hmm, that's exciting. All right, well, let's dive in. So this chapter takes place at Hogwarts, where we find Ginny and Harry relaxing together. They have announced their relationship and the school is buzzing with gossip. Harry is momentarily happy and obsessed with fi finding moments to spend alone with her. One night in the library, Harry is summoned by Professor Dumbledore. On his way to visit his office, he finds Professor Trelawney with empty bottles of sherry in her hands and scattered on the floor. She has just been kicked out of the room of requirements by an unknown individual. During her telling of the story, she also speaks the first time she was interviewed for the job at Hogwarts, when Snape was found listening at the door, where we know he heard the first half of the prophecy. Harry, learning new information that it was Snape that heard the prophecy, he confronts Dumbledore, who then insists, no, he trusts Snape and does not want to hear any more about it. He, however, is on his way to find a horcrux, and as he promised, invites Harry. The chapter ends with them apparating out of Hogsmeade. Yep. And as we're reading the book backwards, we always start with the last sentence, and that is... At once, there was a horrible sensation that Harry was being squeezed through a thick rubber tube. He could not draw breath. Every part of him was being compressed almost past endurance. And then, just when he thought he must suffocate, the invisible band seemed to burst open and he was standing in a cool darkness, breathing in lungfuls of fresh, salty air. Yeah, I would not yeah. do well with apparating. I would definitely no, get sick. <laughs> Sounds like a panic attack in a half second. It just does not sound pleasant to me. Ooh, yeah, totally. That's a good way to yeah. describe it. Yeah. Uh, but as I was saying before, I, I wanted to read the last sentence before I got really excited. I love this chapter because it is a knowledge bomb. There is so much information that gets conveyed in this chapter. We get the room of requirement. We get Trelawney's pr prophecy. We learn about Snape being the one who heard it. We get entrance to like Horcrux understanding about, you know, Harry and Voldemort. And all. It, there's just so much to cover in here. And it just goes really quickly. And I, what I, what I kind of like too, is it happens so fast that Harry can't even process it all. Just like we don't really, it's like when you're reading, and I mean, you might remember this, but when these books came out, people would like read them all in one night, the first night they came out. And you read it so fast that you miss everything. And that's exactly kind of how it hits Harry. And I like that really intense feeling that Harry's having, that the reader is also having as they get all this information given to them. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of tension because you want Harry to continue his thought process and tell Dumbledore no, we really got to take care of this. And instead we just, we have to keep being pushed, which creates uh, that really amazing tension. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yep. Okay. So before we get into the serious bits, I would yeah. like to point out that we finally have the answer to Harry's tattoo question that you uh. asked back last season in the Seven Potters chapter, which was how did Ron know to ask whether or not Harry had a chest tattoo? And it is in this chapter that it is revealed that Ginny has been spreading rumors that Harry has a Hungarian <laughs> horntail tattoo. It is, uh, yep, yep. It's all Ginny. Oh. <laughs> uh. Another reason I love this book so much, like we get sassy, amazing Jenny and it is, I'm just here for it. Like she's so confident and that is not movie Jenny. She's so confident, so sassy and so witty. Like she's had, what, what is it? Five, six brothers. Like she has all brothers. She's the youngest. She is quick witted. She is sharp. Like she is funny. She's tough. Like we get to see that. And I just, um, yeah, I love it. She gets like the best of all of her brothers, be- partially because they yeah. they like test her metal with each of their own characters, right? So she learns all these different pieces and she gets the funny bit from Fred and George and she gets the loyalty from different different brothers. And, you know, I just, yeah, I agree. I love when she's like, she scoffs like, oh, Ron, I have your permission to date Harry. No, I don't. I do what I want. Like, yeah. <laughs> you don't tell me who I do, who I do and don't date. Like we've established that. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Like this is not a thing. <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, it is immediately, immediately much lighter of a chapter, which was uh, nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're moving into that part of the book. Finally, mm-hmm. after a book and a, a third or a book and a quarter, we are finally going to get to some of the funnier, more not I mean, they're serious to the characters like love lives and things are important to all teenagers. But from our adult perspective, it's a little bit lighter than the hunt for horcruxes was. <laughs> yeah, a lot lighter. <laughs> So the first thing is, of course, Harry finding out that it is then Professor Snape who was there when Trelawney, which she doesn't even realize she did a an actual prophecy. I still don't quite understand that, although I guess it adds a little bit of like complexity and funniness to the story of Professor Trelawney. But I just can't imagine being a kid and he keeps... As his life goes on, he keeps finding all these bomb drops. Like, oh, they weren't killed in a car crash. Oh, they were betrayed by their best friend. Oh, no, they were betrayed by their other best friend. And the best friend that was loyal to them got stuck in Azkaban and had to live this horrible life. And he could have been loving me this whole time. And now he finds that the professor that always gives him the hardest time, that hates his guts, he he thinks, is the one that delivered the message to Voldemort himself that was the ripple that started, or at least part of the ripple that started, you know, him being the chosen one and his parents being killed, like, and being a teenage boy, all all that happening. And then can you imagine the rage? Like, oh, that's, that's tough. Yeah. I mean, I think to me, what I get in this chapter is the reality that Snape is such a pivotal part of Harry's story. And we obviously know that to be the case because we're going backwards and we say that a lot like, oh, we see it because we have that perspective and likely everyone listening has read all the books and knows that as well. But it's like Snape is not just some minor villain who's not really related. He is, he's a central character. He's core to the fact that Harry becomes the chosen one and is marked by Voldemort and that the final battle has to happen at all. Without Snape, none of it would have happened. If the prophecy had never been heard by Snape, if it hadn't been Snape, if it had been any other Death Eater, Voldemort might not have believed it to the same extent, right? It's it's all mm. because it's Snape. And Snape has all these abilities that he sort of um, uses to his advantage to both stay alive and to serve Dumbledore and to keep Harry alive, even though he doesn't really love, he doesn't he certainly doesn't love Harry, but he doesn't really want Harry to be alive. I mean, in some ways he's like, I would trade the son for the mother. You know, it, it's all about Snape really. And that's what I think is an interesting thing in the book is that we're seeing as we move backward that this is a story of Snape too. It's not just a story of Harry, it's a story of Snape and on his character developing and how far that comes. And we learn these pieces. Every time there's a knowledge bomb, it's usually something to do with Snape. Yeah. You know, I love that you said that. You're right. It does. It does always have Professor Snape in it. And I'm excited to read this chapter because you're right, or this book, because it is about him. And I don't, I just... It's so interesting to think about Snape's life and all the things that he has done and all the different parts that just this whole world was created by because of all these people making these little bitty, these little bitty movements in their life. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know me, I could go into dive into Snape all day long. I won't do that. But um, yeah, 
I said, I feel like there's this line in the last chapter or the lightning struck tower, which is sort of related to this chapter because that's the card that Trelawney keeps yeah. pulling when she's reading the cards about the future. Anyway, where Dumbledore, no, where Malfoy says he, he's he's a double agent. He's not working for you. He just acts like he is. And I'm like, he's not a double agent. He's like a quadruple agent. He's like a quintuple agent. Like he's an agent on an agent. Like Malfoy, you have no idea how much this man is covering up and how many people he's covering for. Like no wonder he is so unpleasant because he's, he's, he's living all these different lies and all these different stories and none of them are him. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. None of them are actually who he wants to be. He wants to be the man that Lily loved as a, as a, a brother or as a potential boyfriend or whatever. Like he wants to be that good man and he ends up being this man and he doesn't love himself for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine I, I just can't imagine how incredibly lonely and isolating and maybe we've talked about that before, but how isolating his life was. And that is because of mistakes he made as a young kid, as a teenager um, in a very conflicting, very confusing world. And he is literally paying for his mistakes. We've, and I know we've talked about this, but he's paying for these mistakes that he made as a young teenager and trying to repair the thing he did. Um, for years and years to come, which causes him to lead just a very lonely, bitter life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In some ways, he and Dumbledore are quite similar like that. And we talked about that too, where mm -hmm. Dumbledore sees these young men and, and re realizes how easy it is for them to make terrible mistakes. And they are just mistakes and they shouldn't define their lives. And so he's with each of these men, you know, with Malfoy, with Harry, with Snape at a different stage of life, trying to show them you get to choose who you get to who you want to be going forward. Yeah, you can make a mistake. I made mistakes. Like he doesn't really say that, but he we know he does. And you you don't have to go down that path any longer than you want to follow it. You can you can turn away and I I'll be there if you want to turn away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Dumbledore's seen a lot. I think he's seen so many people do that and I I do like um that he's constantly trying to do that. Gosh, he did that for Snape. He does that for everyone. He's constantly trying to mm -hmm. save people from their own selves. Yeah. Interestingly, though, in some ways, he only the only one I can't think of him doing that for, and we obviously haven't gotten to that chapter in this book, is he doesn't really do it for Tom Riddle. Or maybe he does and we just don't see it, but he does not necessarily say, Tom, I see where you're going and you don't have to go that way. He wants him to see that, but I don't know. It's like... Maybe I'm not remembering that part right, but I don't feel like Dumbledore has that same level of understanding for Tom Riddle as a young man turning to the dark I think he, arts that he does for others. So I, I disagree. I think that it's because for Tom Riddle, it happened at such a young age. So when he goes and gets him from the orphanage, he literally says, you don't have to be this way. He sees the deeds that he's done and he doesn't know for sure, right? He has inklings that he's done even worse things. And I feel like he tells him, because I think he even says, like, if you're coming, you can come, but I won't stand for any of this, you know? And I, so I do think he tried. And I feel like there's a couple other parts where he tries to change his ways, but it's almost like it was too late. And so maybe that's, maybe that's mm -hmm. what he's always trying to do with other people is catch them before it's too late and fix what he did with Tom Riddle. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we do know that for some humans their nature is just violent and angry i mean they do can go into prisons and find people like that yeah there's nature and there's nurture in in most criminality if we think of voldemort as just a criminal being a real bad guy but some people have a total disregard for respect for human life or you know and tom riddle does display a lot of that in his younger years much younger than any of the other characters in this story yeah you know, I still, I still would argue that it was mostly nurture that did that to him, though, because he did have such a of. traumatic childhood at a very, very young age, and mm -hmm. of course, you know, so did Harry. So, you know, we could argue, <laughs> we could argue that, but, um, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe he was more predisposed to having a darker nature, but maybe in a world where he lived, you know, his nurture was good and loving, he wouldn't have gone that way. Mm -hmm. You almost have to wonder what the worst situation is. Is it the orphanage? Is it the Dursleys? Or is it Snape's family where his parents fight all the time and don't show him any affection? Like all three of those are terrible situations for children to be brought up in. And yet Harry has a good nature in that is somehow able to endure his trauma. And Snape 
comes out sort of mixed, right? He does good and he does bad. And in the end, he does have a good heart, but it has a, he has a hard time living that truth. And then Voldemort maybe has a darker, it comes from the darker part of the spectrum. And so it just pushes him further that direction. And maybe, again, it was that womb, you know, Harry had a good mom. So it was that love, love <laughs> from the beginning, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, parenting matters. I mean, that's pretty evident. Yeah. Well, no, I just mean <laughs> the life. womb too, you know, like maybe he had all the love in the womb. I don't know. Mm -hmm. so I want to bring something kind of funny so we have Professor Trelawney and she's drunk she's got you know bottles of sherry in her hand on the floor everywhere um and she starts to tell the story and all I can think about is poor Professor Dumbledore because she even says like oh I don't know maybe I shouldn't go see him because I'm getting on his nerves because she keeps talking about you know dark and doom which she apparently did pull the right card the lightning struck tower so that is wasn't completely wrong, but he doesn't want to hear about it anymore. You know, whether, whatever the reason is, she is getting on his nerves. And all I can think about is all those years ago is that he heard that, that prophecy and Snape heard the prophecy. And ever since then, he has to keep this woman safe because somebody else heard this prophecy and he doesn't want anyone else to hear it. And, you know, he even said, all professors at, you know, Hogwarts will have a home with me, but really he had no choice but to keep her safe, no matter how, you know, much of a, a quack or annoying everyone thought she was. And apparently Dumbledore thinks she was, too. So I just, I don't know. I think it's just kind of funny. Like, it's almost like his punishment. <laughs> yeah. It's actually kind of interesting because it suggests that even though she doesn't remember giving the prophecy, someone could extract that memory from her. Like, Voldemort could do a memory charm and get the prophecy out of her. So he, so Dumbledore has to keep her in Hogwarts where she can't be accessed by Voldemort. Right. Yeah. Or the prophecy. Because, yeah, I guess you're right. Because the same prophecy wouldn't come out twice. But I guess you're right. He would be able to extract mm -hmm. the memory. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was yeah. weird anyway, that she doesn't remember yeah, the prophecy. I don't know. Again, I think I said that earlier. Maybe it's just part of her. It makes it funnier that she's like. Well, she goes into a trance. She, like, actually is not in herself. Like, it isn't even her own voice. Yeah. Because she has the prophecy. She has that other prophecy about Peter Pettigrew escaping and going back to the Dark Lord at the end of, uh, well, not end, but two-thirds of the way through Prisoner of Azkaban. Right. And she doesn't remember that either. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. There's a whole other branch of magic. Divination. Yeah. <laughs> that we don't really get a good sense of because it is Trelawney and she isn't, she is, she's like 97% a quack. Yeah. Um, but then she has like the 3% that's really super important to the story and really, really needs to be protected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you have anything cool. else? Well, did you have anything else from this chapter? I did not. Did you? Nope. That's it for me. Okay. This was a, this was a good one. I like this one. I always like getting all that information and chewing on it. So. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I am excited for the future chapters. So. Yeah. Now we move back into the lighter stuff and the different pieces of Tom Riddle's backstory and all that good stuff. Yeah. So with that, we will wrap it up and get to those episodes shortly. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, we would love to have your ratings and reviews, five-star ratings, reviews. You can leave them on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also leave them as comments on YouTube if you're watching us on YouTube and you can find us on social media. Yep. Uh, head to Instagram. We are Bell Jar Pod. Uh, we're also on TikTok and Twitter. If you want to, feel free to send us an email. It is podcast at follow the butterflies. Follow the butterflies is an incredible website that Valerie has created. It is a world of magic, everything Harry Potter you could possibly want. <laughs> um, so you should check that out as well. But um, yeah. I am so glad you all joined us and I hope that we will you will stop by and